ವಸುದೇವ ಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣೂರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕೀ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ವಿ ಆರ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿಂಗ್ ದ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಆನ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಫೈವ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ಡ್ ಸನ್ಯಾಸ ಯೋಗ ದ ಯೋಗ ಆಫ್ ಸನ್ಯಾಸ ರಿನೌನ್ಸಿಯೇಷನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅರ್ಜುನ ಆಸ್ಟ್ ಅ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ that you have taught me renunciation of action and the performance of action which is good which is better which one will lead me to the highest goal that is moksha um, enlightenment and freedom tell me one with certainty now we saw last time in the discussion of this question that these question this question can be interpreted in uh, two ways in one way it does not make much sense because if if you were talking about the performance of karma yoga or the or gyana yoga uh, doing your action uh, without uh, selfish motive doing duty for duty's sake or as as a worship of god uh, for the purification of the mind and um, gyana yoga for getting knowledge for getting enlightenment well then both are necessary there's no option there one has to purify oneself and make one make the mind ready for enlightenment and for enlightenment one has to pursue this vedantic inquiry so in that sense there is no choice but there is a choice in the, in the sense of what kind of life should i lead to achieve enlightenment i want enlightenment i want god realization i want the final freedom but before me there are different approaches we have been told that one can attain it while remaining um, a householder in the midst of action in the midst of worldly relationships and yet become enlightened or one can leave all of that and become an all renouncing um, monk completely dedicated to vedantic inquiry and meditation and um, without any relationships with the world no possessions no relationships no obligations or duties that is also possible so which one these two are possible and last time we discussed there some religions which stress maybe over stress monasticism um early buddhism was very monastic though no mahayana is much more uh, uh, balanced but the early Buddh- um, theravada buddhism was very monastic uh, jainism is very monastic um there are religions which do not stress monasticism at all or completely forbid it so for example uh, in uh, islam or in judaism they have ascetic traditions but not monastic traditions as such uh, even sikhism the sikhs have great respect for monks i have seen that in the himalayas so sikhs come and you know there's they have a bhandara of uh, they feed the monks and have very great respect and there there is a hindu monks vedantic monks uh, but the sikhs themselves do not advocate uh, renunciation and uh, monastic life so that's very interesting um and there are religions like say uh, christianity catholic christianity and uh, hinduism which have strong monastic traditions and yet uh, they do not stress it or overstress the monastic aspect of it so all this all these so in the hinduism the both of these options are open one may one may um remain as a householder and become enlightened one may actually um one can become a monk from the very beginning from the brahmacharya stage itself so like we we become monks in the ramakrishna order we uh, become monks at the very beginning of our uh, lives you know before getting into the uh, householder life or what was traditionally prescribed that at one point one may go beyond householder life and become a monk uh, become a sanyasi i know such people and they are uh, householders and then they retired from their jobs the children grew up and went away and then maybe the person usually men i have met who had no more obligations uh, maybe the wife had died and uh, or the children were no longer in touch and this person decides i want to become a monk formally and that has also happened uh, i've seen that a lot of that so which of them so what do i do Uh, arjun is asking so we shall see sri krishna's answer 
वर्स नंबर टू श्री भगवान उवाच संन्यास कर्म योग तयोस्तु कर्म संन्यासात कर्म योगो विशिष्यते द ब्लेसेड लॉर्ड सेड रिनंसिएशन एंड परफॉर्मेंस ऑफ सेल्फलेस एक्शन बोथ लीड टू लिबरेशन बट ऑफ द टू द परफॉर्मेंस ऑफ सेल्फलेस एक्शन इज सुपीरियर टू द रिनंसिएशन ऑफ एक्शन सो द वर्ड्स हियर यूज्ड हियर आर संन्यास एंड कर्म योग संन्यास एंड कर्म योग बोथ विल लीड यू टू मोक्ष here just um, you know this but i'm still putting it out there so that you uh, are aware of it i am giving these interpretations based on uh, shankara acharya's interpretation is an advaitic interpretation i'm giving because if you take up um, other interpretations these words same words will be interpreted in different ways so for example in this verse i will say according to the advaitic interpretation sanyasa and karma yoga both lead to moksha now what sanyasa means here is one gives up worldly possessions and relationships and formally assumes you know the ochre robe the vows of sanyasa and gives up um, secular and worldly religious duties also and then one becomes a monk and uh, has no possessions no no obligations no relationships and is one is dedicated entirely to vedantic inquiry so the bulk of the time and energy is spent in what in shravana manana niridhyasana and even here in monasticism there are two kinds of monks uh, one is called uh, vidvat sanyasa another one is called vividisha sanyasa the vidvat sanyasa is the renunciation of the enlightened a person who has already become enlightened before taking to formal monasticism has already realized i am brahman now may decide to become a monk formally because that seems to that person to be the best expression of that person's enlightenment that kind of lifestyle is most suited so one may become a monk but that person has not become a monk in order to become enlightened is already free is a jivan mukta and feels that being a monk is the easiest way to express enlightenment to live the life of a jivan mukta um, the other kind of monk most of us are in the second kind the second kind is vividisha sanyasa vividisha means desire to know the desire to become enlightened we have come into monastic life in order with a desire to become enlightened with a desire to get brahma gyana the knowledge of brahman so vividisha sanyasa we are not enlightened yet and we need all spiritual practices including karma yoga so we have a whole set of spiritual practices which are prescribed and such monks but they are monks they are formally monks and they do not have worldly responsibilities so that's one group and they will practice shravana manana niridhyasana plus some kind of upasana will be given uh, in our ramakrishna order we continue the practice of ishta devata and ishta mantra among traditional vedantic monks they may not do that they may they may up to becoming a monk they may repeat the gayatri mantra after becoming a monk they give up the gayatri mantra they may repeat om just om itself uh, that's a that's a kind of meditation and there will be karma yoga um, they'll have to work for the ashram or to you know serve the guru or do some kind of karma yoga um, the usual uh, rituals of the hindu grihastha are not meant for monks whereas and and therefore they and in this way they will attain enlightenment hopefully whereas those who are in worldly life in in uh, grihastha ashram if they want to become enlightened he says karma yoga they will perform karma yoga now all the work that they do all the duties they perform at home on the community or in their careers now mentally the attitude changes earlier why were they doing it dharma artha kama kama for attainment of pleasure artha for attainment of success and power and you know uh, wealth and dharma Uh, the basis of on the basis of morality and ethics they would pursue these worldly goals that was the life of a householder and they would also perform religious duties so that they accumulate merit after death they go to heaven swarga prapti but they'll come back again so this once the person decides this is not for me i want the highest god realization but remaining in worldly life 
then that person takes to karma yoga all those things are performed now but as a worship of god and then here is the advaitic interpretation it's addition which is not clear in the verse itself will that person by performing karma yoga attain to enlightenment advaita vedanta would say no 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 with by performance of karma yoga purification of mind will be there and they need to undergo um, shravana manana niridhyasana the full course of gyana yoga list they have to come to the gita class basically to put it in very simply uh, you have to do your duties in the world and you know family but as karma yoga and come to the class and uh, you know do self inquiry meditate on it till one gets enlightenment and that's possible in household life too he says so this is the meaning of the first line nishreyasha karau ubho nishreyasha means the highest welfare um so nishreyasha is highest welfare um in fact in the introduction to the bhagavad gita shankaracharya says dvividho hi vedokta dharma pravritti lakshana nivritti lakshana scha the vedic religion has two aspects it's a beautiful uh, description of what religion is what is religion after all so shankaracharya says the vedic religion has two aspects pravritti lakshana nivritti lakshana pravritti and nivritti so vivekananda has used these terms again and again pravritti literally means circling outwards going out into the world action literally it means action nivritti means withdrawal the inward journey the spiritual journey what are the purposes of these two pravritti is abhyudaya abhyudaya means welfare uh, prosperity growth development so the whole course of human development personal and uh, civilizational all that is cover- covered under abhyudaya and religion is helpful there religion is meant for that it it gives you morals and ethics it you have the blessings of god for the spiritual journey all of these things are necessary for a family life for your personal life family life and a, and the civilizational life so for the growth of uh, for prosperity growth for your own self development to become a better pers- person a bigger person you know to have full play to your talents achieve things in the world you know in the field of whether it's business or education or art or science wherever all sorts of growth and development uh, betterment human betterment that is called abhyudaya and that is the purpose of religion that you might say that one might do that without religion also truly and especially in today's world we are more secular than it has ever been in known history our modern uh, civilization especially in the advanced countries is more secular less religious than it has ever been in the history known history of humanity so we are pursuing secular goals of human development without religion but religion has a role to play it has a psychological role to play for good for our psychological health it is um, it gives us ethics and morals and so on so there is a big debate now can you have an ethical society a moral society without religion without any kind of religion um, there are um, this reasoning on both sides i remember i had an interesting discussion in the monastery you are often discuss it in india is such a religious country so much corruption and so many problems in society and uh, i remember the first time i visited i went outside india i saw singapore and i went to australia both are very high functioning states you know if you always see the top 10 in living standards australia new zealand will always be there in the top 10 um, very little corruption very advanced in terms of technology very prosperous uh, very little poverty so i asked and in both cases i saw very little religion so <laughs> religion is become less and less important over over time so you have a high functioning civil society without religion now what does this mean one monk said that oh, this is just a recent phenomenon you have to give it time give it 100 years 200 years with a completely uh, secular non religious society and see what the effect is right now you have centuries of you know everybody who was more or less australian until last you know like until the 60s or 70s 
they were all uh, Christians. They had centuries of um, Christian tradition behind them. The whole civilization was uh, a Christian civilization. In Singapore, you have uh, Buddhism and Confucianism and Christianity and Hinduism. Um, so the effect of all of these is, is, is still very much there. You can't say that it is a completely religion-less society. On the other hand, um, one gentleman in Australia said, religion has been declining over the last 20, 30 years um, until um, 1960s, 70s. Religion was pretty strong. People went to church and it was pretty religious, also pretty corrupt, pretty racist. And, and now he says, people have lost interest in religion, all sorts of religion. And um, pretty prosperous, pretty, you know, this is one of the least corrupt countries in the world. So what do you say? That religion is not necessary for ethics and morals? I don't know the answer really. I mean, if you have a completely secular society, which is also very moral and ethical, that, that would be interesting. Um, yeah. But anyway, Shankaracharya says one of the purposes of uh, religion is abhyudaya personal and societal development. Religion helps and the blessings of God are necessary. And uh, also remember, in the Vedic um, idea, it was not just in this life. You also want a very good life after this. So you go to heaven and after that a better birth, uh, better placement next time. Uh, so all of that is given by Pravritti Lakshana, the, the, the part of religion which is um, concerned with the Vedic karma kanda, the ritualistic portion of the Vedas. That's a kind of conventional religion. And then Shankaracharya says another part of religion is Nivritti Lakshana, the uh, religion which is circling inwards, which is the inward spiritual journey. What is the goal there? The, what is the goal in the first one? Development, prosperity, growth, betterment, human betterment. What is the goal in the second one? Uh, it says Nishreyasha. Nishreyasha, Shankaracharya they uses the word Nishreyasha, which means moksha, freedom from this entire cycle of birth and death. So religion is covers both. To put it simply, religion has these two aspects. There's a conventional part of religion where, and I like to put it this way, we use God for your own welfare. God is a convenience for my life. Um, you know, my life is better if I add a little bit of God to it. And the second kind of religion, the higher religion, the spirituality, is um, it, my life for God. The goal of my life becomes God. The goal of my life in the first one is betterment, welfare, and God helps. The goal of my life in the second, in the second one is um, God, God itself, himself, herself, or itself. Enlightenment is the goal. So here in the Gita, already it is the second goal. Very clearly. That's why I never tire, I'm never tired of repeating this again and again. Whatever one may use the Gita for, for management, for physical health, for um, you know, positive psychology, for therapy, all those things are fine. But the Gita is a moksha shastra, is a, is a scripture teaching you the second goal of religion, the higher goal of religion, spiritual freedom. That's why he says both of these are paths of spiritual freedom. Nishreya shakara ubhav. Ubho means both, uh, the uh, householder spiritual seeker and the monastic spiritual. The monastic is by definition a spiritual seeker. Why would you adopt a monastic life unless you are a spiritual seeker? And the householder is by choice a spiritual seeker. But Arjuna's question was not this. Arjuna's question was, tell me one, which is better for me. And then he says, Tayos to karma sannyasad, among the two, Better than becoming a monk is to be a spiritual seeker in householder life. He says, karma yoga vishishyate. Karma yoga is better than you know, performing your actions in life, in worldly life, in a spirit of karma yoga is better than giving up the actions. In Sanskrit is sarupata tyaga, giving the actions up altogether. Not engaging in um, you know, doing anything in the community or in the family just withdrawing to an ashram, a cave, or a hut in the Himalayas. That's an alternative, and that's possible, and you can become enlightened by that. That's all very clear. Let's be clear about that. And yet, uh, Krishna says that the 
path of the householder, spiritual seeker is better, is better. There are advantages. Then number three, what sort of advantage? Why is this better? Remember, Krishna has an ulterior motive here. Arjuna is all ready to run away and become a monk. Krishna wants him to fight this battle. So Krishna says, no, no, this one, you can fight the battle, be a prince and a warrior and become enlightened too. Wouldn't that be great? Third verse. Geya sa nitya sanyasi yona dveshti na kankshati nidvandvo hi mahabaho sukham bandhat pramuchyate So the person who has neither raga or dvesha, likes or dislikes, should be known as a perpetual renouncer of action. The perpetual sanyasi is already naturally a monk for, O mighty armed one, one who is free from the dual throng is easily freed from bondage. So there is an advantage to householder life. The advantage is, you know, Sri Ramakrishna, the Holy Mother and others, they would say that, uh, why would you wander around uh, begging for a morsel of food? I'm, I think I mentioned uh, how Swami Turiyananda in Vrindavan in austere, you know, wandering as a wandering monk, you're supposed to beg for food uh, up to three houses, five houses or seven houses. One day he begged for food from 30 houses and it was a very poor area. Nobody had anything to give except a piece of dry bread, chapati. Um, so he was exhausted and he was dismayed and, and frustrated. He was thinking, I, people are working, poor people are working to earn their livelihood. I'm a parasite. I'm uh, not doing anything, not producing anything. And he went to sleep under a tree and then you know, he had that experience of, of expanding to include the whole universe. And he felt, I am the Atman, this whole thing itself. I'm identified with everything. And he had this great feeling of joy. Um, but another time, he got one piece of dry chapati after begging a lot. And uh, he's, he went to a well and he dipped the, that bread in water of the well. And he stuffed that soggy chapati into his mouth, telling his body, eat, eat, for, for you I'm put, I'm put to so much trouble, just to feed you. So it's like he's feeding the body. So there are advantages. Notice when people would come to Sri Ramakrishna, when householders would come to Sri Ramakrishna and say that, uh, should we give up then? And Sri Ramakrishna would always say, why should you give up? You should stay in, in uh, householder life and call on God. And there are, then he would say there are so many advantages to a householder life. But for a select few, those uh, young boys who became the first generation of monks, led by Narendranath, who became Vivekananda, when they came, in no uncertain terms, he encouraged them to become monks. Uh, I mean, when their parents were outraged and they would come and tell Sri Ramakrishna, you tell them they should get married and get jobs. And he would say, I tell them, they, but they don't listen. And when the parents would go away, he would praise those boys and say, don't listen to them. <laughs> that you, He would encourage them to become monks. Only to a small group. Um, so now the problem is, immediately the big objection in our minds would be in householder life, there are so many obligations. And there are so many preoccupations and distractions. So our time and energy is taken up. You have to earn a livelihood. You have to take care of yourself and other people. You have to take up responsibilities, not only for your family, but for, for example, if you have a job, if you have some responsible position in, in uh, society. Arjuna is a general in an army, just imagine. So, so many responsibilities. In comparison, the monk has nothing. It's just, just that person. Uh, and um, at the most, an ashram, which is also you can do in a detached way because it's uh, there's no personal axe to grind there. So isn't it much easier to be a monk? So first of all, later he will say why it is not easier to be a monk. But now he says that in householder life, it is true that there is a lot of um, demands upon you. And what it manifests at, as is, he says, is Raga Dvesha is the problem. He says here, um, yona dveshti na kangshati, the one who does not um, is not repulsed or has no strong dislikes, no strong desires. 
See, the real problem in householder life is not that there are so many responsibilities. I have seen monks managing huge institutions, lots and lots of responsibilities. I've seen many monks without any responsibility at all. That's also there. But some monks I've seen at least. So, for example, I saw Lokeshwar Nandaji, Institute of Culture uh, in Gold Park in Calcutta. Huge institution. Hundreds of people working there. Lots of problems. At that time, there was a Marxist government in power in uh, West Bengal and trade unions and they were generally anti-religion. And so organizations run by religious organizations, you know, like monks, they're always targeted. So all sorts of problems they faced. But they managed, they, they shouldered all those huge responsibilities so lightly, you know, with peace and a smile and, and with kindness and grace. So the problem is not responsibility. The problem is not relationships. The problem is not possessions. The problem is our relate, our internal, the way we relate to these things. Normally, what happens is why it is uh, householder life is such a struggle. It is not so much the external problem as our reaction to those problems. It is our raga dvesha, our likes and dislikes. Likes and dislikes is a mild word. Raga literally means uh, intense attachment, intense desire. Dvesha means dislike. Um, a, a repulsion and we are guided by that and there are many such sources which continually awaken this kind of likes and dislikes desires in our mind we have endless unexplained expectations yes that's another good way of putting it we have huge expectations of the world of um, people of husband wife even more expectation of children uh, even more expect and, and expectations of colleagues, of society, of um, politics and political parties. So many expectations. And unexamined. We feel we, uh, we deserve these things. We feel we are entitled. And then we are shocked when these desires are not fulfilled. I was just reading. Um, there was a very smart psychologist here in New York many years ago. Nobody reads him nowadays, I think. Dr. Albert Ellis. Uh, so Albert Ellis, uh, he, I looked him up once. It says that at one time he was rated higher than Carl Jung. I mean, he was this, like the uh, most highly rated psychologist after Freud for some time. And he was right here in New York. Anyway, I was reading in his, one of his books, he says, one of the first things I tell patients when they come to me, who come to me for counseling, one so of the first things I tell them is the road to hell is paved with unrealistic expectations. The road to hell is paved with unrealistic expectations. Uh, he uh, gives an example of a patient, a name he has not given, maybe a lady or whatever it is. This patient says uh, that I had been troubled by this person who was a drunkard. And one day I came to the very simple realization that you cannot have these expectations of a drunkard. See, what was happening is this person said, I, I deserve to be treated better. Any normal person expects uh, this basic um, you know, behavior, this basic decent behavior from another person. And this person, he realized, no, I cannot expect that. Because that person is a drunkard, is, is uh, alcoholic, you cannot expect normal reactions, behavior, response, even the ordinary things which you expect decent behavior from others, you cannot expect it at all. And he says, it's a very simple thing. But this patient said, it was a great revelation to me. This person with whom I had struggled for so many years, against whom I have got so much resentment and rage built up, most of it is due to my unrealistic expectation of something that person cannot give. So this is, I realized what the doctor had said, road to hell is paved with unrealistic expectations. Sri Krishna is saying, most of the problems, he says, why one cannot be spiritual in um, householder life is because of our unrealistic expectations. Really, the problem is not with householder life. The problem is not with, um, uh, with family. The problem is not with um, relationships, with possessions, with duties 
with uh, with uh, responsibilities all of those things can be managed if we manage our expectations and to manage your expectation the two things raga and dvesha likes and dislikes if the whole thing is now converted into karma yoga i do not want anything from these people i do not want anything from these relationships no expectations this is a battlefield for me it is an ashram for me in fact household is grihastha ashram in uh, in uh, the household life itself is called an ashram every stage of life is called an ashram an ashram is a place for spiritual development so grihastha ashram is a ashram for spiritual development and here all these things which i have to do because of my relationship because of my position because of my responsibilities i shall do as karma yoga as the worship of god it is a special kind of spiritual sadhana which i am performing does not matter how others react whether they satisfy my expectations or not it does not matter i have to see whether i am doing sadhana whether i am doing karma yoga if you do that what a high praise krishna has for that attitude he says geya sa nitya sanyasi he this person is ever a monk a monk is somebody who gives up these responsibilities maintains serenity and practices spiritual um, uh, practices in in solitude you know in distance from samsara whereas this person in the midst of samsara in the midst of family he says he is nitya sanyasi sanyasi means is ever a monk is already a monk this person who lives like this managing expectations within uh, samsara yona dveshti na kankshati who has these no unreasonable hatreds or unreasonable expectations we may say yeah but i have reasonable expectations no you don't <laughs> all our expectations from samsara are unreasonable who are you to demand anything from anybody we demand that because we go into samsara with the idea this is for my enjoyment this is for my satisfaction it is not from the very beginning we have made a huge mistake it is a place for spiritual practice just like an ashram is a place for spiritual practice if you go into it with that attitude what can i give here how can i serve here my lord has come in the form of husband wife children my lord has come in the form, form of my co-workers my neighbors how do i best serve how do i best do my duties as as puja as spiritual practice then you will see this problem will resolve itself very easily that is the only difference i have seen monks who manage uh, huge institutions hospital institute of culture i mentioned um, swami lokeshwaran ji i heard from a monk that once there was a communist agitation and uh, they got word that a huge crowd was going to come and surround the uh, institute and they're going to throw rocks and so one of the monks said let me call the police and swami lokeshwaran ji told him no no need to call the police and the uh, expected thing happened the next day this monk told me himself next day as expected there was a big crowd outside shouting slogans and throwing rocks and we heard one big rock smash through the window of uh, the swami's office the secretary's office so we ran down there to see what happened and we saw swami lokeshwaran ji was writing a letter at his desk and the big window had been smashed a rock had actually come into the office and was lying on the carpet with smashed glass lokeshwaran ji just had looked up and he came went back to his writing now how is that possible uh, how is that possible that story is there about is attachment and detachment you know the uh, classic story about janaka raja and uh, shukadeva So Sukadeva, the the paradigm of a great monk who has completely renounced everything, who has only um, you know has his loin cloth and nothing else in the world, he comes to the Emperor Janaka for a discussion about Vedanta. So they are having a discussion on about Vedanta. Janaka is an em- emperor, but he is also very interested in Vedanta, and so they have a discussion about Atman and Brahman and so on, till the news comes that the the city of Mithila is on fire. and the whole the capital city is on fire and uh, the monk shukadeva is out of there like an arrow he runs out like an arrow here somewhere he goes then he comes back to watch 
Janak is he's still sitting there on the chair, uh, smiling. What happened, oh Swami? Where did you go? And panting, Shukadeva says, "Oh, it's all right. I have one change of, you know, the loin cloth. That's my only dress. The only dress he has got in the world, and nothing else in the possession in the world. One loin cloth and one change, so which I had washed in the river and I'd hung it out to dry on that uh, tree, branch of a tree." And I thought, if the fire spreads to that tree and it burns up the loin cloth, I went to check and I saw it's all right, it's not burnt. And Janaka smiles and he says, Mithilayam pradigdayam nami dahati kinchana. If the entire city were to burn down, nothing of mine would be burnt. Um, so now it's not that it's not like Nero fiddles while Rome burns, not like that. He's doing whatever needs to be done. Whatever needs to be done in the moment, he's doing that. And yet, it's absolutely serene. Now, it does not mean that by becoming a monk, like literally, physically giving up all things, you'll be free of attachment. You'll be actually able to manage uh, likes and dislikes. May not be. May not be. Um, I have seen monks who, after becoming, they have no responsibilities in the world, completely free of all, all responsibilities, uh, where, no, no possessions. But see, where the mind becomes attached, still very much involved in... Uh, so, for example, just to give an example, when I was in the Himalayas, somebody told me of a particular monk who was very well known for his renunciation. He would not touch money. So, no money. What did he do? All the, of course, lots of devotees came to him, especially because he would not touch money. Uh, he would, uh, they would bow down to him and offer him money. And he had this long pair of pincers with which he would grasp the coins and put it in a box. If you have to go to all that extent, why not touch the money itself? If you are going to accumulate money for the ashram or whatever, fine. So, yeah, so Raga Dvesha. On the other hand, uh, I had no of a particular Swami in one of our ashrams. So one gentleman who is to be a volunteer for that ashram, he would say that the Swami, um, the old Swami who has passed away now, who was the head of that, it's a small ashram in Calcutta. Whatever money the devotees would give, he would throw into one of the drawers in his uh, table. So whenever I would go and ask, we need money for shopping or we need to buy money to buy something for the temple or shrine or something, like whatever, he would thrust his hand into that drawer and pull out money, whatever was there. He never knew what was there. He never counted. He never bothered. So he was there. Money is right there. But there's no attachment, no interest in it at all. Now, which is better? Who is managing uh, expectations, attachments to money better? Of course, I, I'm not recommending that as people in the world of householders, you follow such financial methods of management and you'll be in trouble. <laughs> you can do perfectly good. I've seen monks who perfectly manage the accounts and finances. Many such monks were really good at it. Not one paisa, one, one cent of that belongs to them, but everything's done perfectly. Um, the accounts and the money, the investments of an ashram and maintain because it's for them, it's a puja. It's, it's a, I, I knew a monk, I won't tell his name, he was in charge of investing money for our main monastery in Belur. He grew to be so good at his job that financial company with his, with his investment wizards would come to ask not for spiritual advice, for investment advice from him. <laughs> But he didn't make one, one uh, cent out of it, one rupee out of it. It was just for the ashram. Another monk um, who was an expert in dairy farming, so Goshala in the ashram, he told me something. And he, he was so well known that uh, veterinary doctors would come to him, that the, the big institutes which ran huge dairies would ask him to visit and give, give them advice. And other ashrams would call him. Not that all monks who are in charge of um, dairies are, are, are experts. This monk was, is also. I asked him and he told me, you know what happened? I was a novice, not even a sannyasi. And there was an old Swami in charge of the dairy, which was very run down and was like in poor condition. And the Swami died. And the head, the head of the monastery told me, you go and take charge uh, of the dairy. I said, I, I have no idea. I've never even milked a cow. I'm scared of cows. So it doesn't matter. It's God's work. You go and do whatever you can. So he said, I set about to it. 
I asked people who knew, and I worked with my own hands cleaning the dairy. Uh, I asked veterinary, veterinary doctors, consulted them. I stayed up late in the night. You know, after reading Vedanta, I would read veterinary books. I would. I went to uh, take courses on dairy management till he became an expert. This is this is a pun that works only in um, uh, Bengali. So I'll try my best to translate it. He's a very humorous Swami. So he said, "You know, the grace of God is upon me. I have done Guru Seva to Korechi, Guru Seva Korechi. So, so there's a pun on the word. Guru means cow, and Guru means, of course, spiritual master. And as a spiritual novice, you are supposed to serve the spiritual master. That's one of the duties. The karma yoga, a monastic novice, is supposed to do." So he said, instead of serving the guru, I serve the guru. That means I serve the cow. Uh, but the effect is the same. Um, all right. One more point and I'll, then I'll move ahead. So the idea is, if you manage expectations, if you manage Raga Dvesha, if you, and how do you do that? By converting everything that we do in, in our daily lives in samsara, in grihastha ashrama, into karma yoga. You are as good as a monk, uh, who is uh, like a real sincere uh, spiritual seeker, a monk who has given up all these attachments. You, you in fact, you will not have no disadvantage. What seems to be a disadvantage in grihastha life is basically because of the way we deal with the problems in grihastha life, in, in household life. So that was his point. Just one point a senior monk told me, which matches what, what Sri Krishna is saying here. A senior monk told me, you know, it is the high class of spiritual seekers, the evolved class of spirit, advanced spiritual seekers, who can deal with their problems in meditation, who can sit in meditation and as things come up from the subconscious mind, they can deal with them. It can be done. One can overcome one's uh, past conditioning by meditation. But it requires a very highly trained mind and a very pure mind which can do that. And then he said, for the rest of us, for ordinary people like us, we need external struggle. We need external struggle. We have to deal with difficult people. We have to work hard. We have to put up with physical illness. All of these forms of external struggle, which are richly available in householder life. And ashram life also will provide it to you when you get into an ashram. So uh, that is actually good for spiritual development. It's good for spiritual development. It's not good at the beginning to be left completely alone in a cave in the, in the Himalayas. Very soon you get tired of it. How long will you feel poetic about it's just wind blasted, icy rock and, and waterfalls and, and just solitude turning into like a vacuum of loneliness if the mind is not ready you're driven mad by that kind of life nirdvandohi mahabaho sukham bandhatva mutyate sukham bandhat means easily in if you lead this kind of a life in householder life you are set free from bondage easily you see one would expect the opposite it is easier if you are a monk it seems to be so Monks have it easy. You don't have any, you don't have to earn your living. We are providing for you. You don't have to maintain a house. Uh, either you're in a cave or a hut or an ashram, which is maintained by uh, devotees. Everything is maintained in society by householders, not by monks or by students. You know, Brahmacharya ashram, Sannyasa ashram, Vanaprastha ashram. All three are built on the foundation of Grihastha ashram. So the householder is the one who is the foundation of society. So it seems everything is easy for the monk. But no, spiritual life is actually easier. Um, Sri Ramakrishna says the one who thinks of God in the midst of the struggles of society is a hero. Before I go on, let me just take a look at the activity in the chat and questions. Prabir Babu says, I understand monasticism in India really started with Buddha. Is this correct? No. 
even the buddha's own life what turned him towards spiritual life what is the fourth thing that he saw a monk he saw an old person sick person dead person and then the fourth thing he saw was a monk and there were so many monks buddha himself met them there were lots of them at that time and for a long time go way b- before buddha brihadaranya upanishad the hero of vedanta who is the first hero of vedanta yagya valkya who was married he had two wives and what is what happens at the end of the he was already enlightened and what happens at the end of the brihadaranya upanishad he becomes a monk he leaves and walks away and he becomes a monk becoming a monk it, it you come across it again and again in the upanishads in the vedas so long before buddhism long before jainism in the vedic society also monasticism was there but yes in a big way it came into being with buddhist monasticism the jainas are not given enough credit jain monasticism also is highly developed along with the buddhist monasticism um vishwanathan says could you please help us understand arjun's motivation behind sanyasa he did not say that directly but see the whole idea was he did not want to fight that war and now krishna told him about enlightenment you will become god realize god that's the goal of life then the solution is inevitable that it's it's uh, it just follows straight away i don't want to do this nasty stuff and i want to become enlightened that really sounds good and the way to become enlightened becoming enlightened is to give up all this go to a mountain or a forest and meditate and that's it so he wanted to follow that. that's something that krishna wanted him wanted him not to do to stop that in chapter 4 sri krishna taught arjun the way to see brahman in all actions in everyday life given that why is arjun considering becoming a monk rather than seeing the action in front of him as yagya yes that is the crucial teaching um, yagya that karmana to do all action as yagya that purifies and leads to enlightenment arjuna has heard only partially not fully absorbed it's actually a see the clear teaching is here in householder life you are pursuing dharma artha kama you want moksha be a monk so that kind of division was very clear and uh, so to break that mold to be in the householder life and become enlightened and um, that idea sri krishna is pushing and it's not a new idea actually in the vedas in upanishads you see many of the rishis who have taught the upanishads many of them were householders the father is teaching the son husband is teaching the wife there are women in the court of uh, of the kings who are questioning uh, vedantic philosopher yagya valkya's greatest opponent and questioner in the court was um, gargi so all of this was there and uh, most of them were householders but yes arjuna has not fully absorbed the implications and it's our benefit also that the whole thing has been explained in detail over the next several chapters it will go on this theme will be repeated again and again by the way um, i'm selling it very hard what are uh, krishna's vision of becoming an enlightened uh, householder like like himself or like janaka but is also true that it's very difficult <laughs> it's difficult bill says ethical values are transcendent even without god per se so says swami ji yes that is true ethical values themselves can lead to enlightenment if you pursue goodness far enough it becomes god good becomes god abhijit says after day of an office it becomes evident end of the day that most of the issues and pressures that we felt during the day were result of friction caused by ego may be similar to unrealistic expectations or likes and dislikes correct correct this is what is being pointed out the real friction which causes tiredness frustration unhappiness complication is is within us it's not so much the office or the family or the you know problems will be there anyway you run away from uh, difficult people in the family you will find difficult people in the ashram in the householder life it's uh, the struggle is little more of course i know the story about a monk who was grumbling to a devotee it was many years ago 
I don't like this ashram. So in our system, we have many ashrams. And if we have problems somewhere, we can. We're supposed to adjust and stay there, but we can ask our main monastery for a transfer. So this Swami was saying to this gentleman, or devotee, that I'll go away. I'll take a transfer and go away. Then that old gentleman was sitting here. He smiled and said, Swami, you can do that. But spare a thought for us. We married people in jobs and in you know householder life we will stay with the same people till the end of our lives we can't keep changing you have the option today you don't like it you walk away you'll get another set of people another place and an entirely new setup not possible for us i cannot go away from this house and this place into another house another place at like a drop of a hat like you can so that was a big lesson for that monk that uh, it is possible and it's much better to adjust where you are. Ultimately, you cannot run away from your problems. These problems have been are, are the product of our prarabdha karma. So if I try to run away from them, they will come in another form in the other place. I become I have so many troubles because of uh, you know, job pressures and so many problems in this world. I give it up. I become a monk. I have no connection with earning money. I have no connection with people. I have no responsibilities. I will sit and read Gita only. Suddenly I will find body is ill. Sickness comes in the body. The same karma, which was giving me trouble in household life in some way, is now giving me trouble. What is the last thing that I have got? I can't give up the body. The body is there. It will give me trouble. In the ashram, there will be difficult people in the ashram. So these problems will keep following us. Ramya says, is that what Swamiji means when he says, be free from hope for nothing from anyone? Yes. Uh, work also. Seek not, avoid not. Swami Vivekananda gave a nice formula. Avoiding is what Arjuna wanted to do. And a restless person keeps on seeking newer and newer projects. And what to do next? Fill up the day. From morning till evening, keep busy. Especially in, in these countries, I see people are very... Uh, up and doing. So if you're, if there is a spot in your calendar which is free, it makes you uneasy. Why is it free? Let me fill it up with some activity. No, that is restlessness. Neither seek nor avoid. Brahmacharya ashram precedes Grihastha ashram. Was the Brahmacharya training for the householders? Prabir Babu asked. Yes, it was training for householders and monks. So at the end of Brahmacharya ashram, you actually have an option. Do you want to go into Grihastha Ashram and householder life or do you become, want to become a monk? Why would you want to become a monk? The whole idea was taught that ultimately the whole purpose is God-realization, is enlightenment. Do you want to take the scenic route, then go and become a marry and get a job and go out into the world, do all these things? Or do you want to take uh, the less scenic route, the direct uh, path and become a monk straight away? Do you have that kind of... That, the problem with the monastic life will be talked about next why it is it requires extra preparation it's not all that it's not as easily available option as one might think okay i've got two options i can be a household i can be a monk not so abhijit asks is the consequence of our actions and expectation of enjoyment fruit of the action is that where our expectations come from yes our expectations come from sense of entitlement or expectations come from the desire for enjoyment. Gita Dev asks, um, struggles of life teaches the tiksha. Grihastha Ashram is a great way to develop in nature. The tiksha is forbearance, patience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Grihastha Ashram, householder life in the family and in your uh, community, in the career, it develops the quality of patience, forbearance, which is very, very important. Just remember that beautiful insight from Dr. Albert Ellis, that wise old psychologist. Unrealistic expectations are, the, the road to hell is paved with unrealistic expectations. Perfect karma yogi will be very close to being a jnani, if not already correct. Purification of mind leads to jnana almost directly. As Advaitins, we will insist on Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. But the fact is, practically speaking, 
realization is very fast. I've seen myself. Um, monks who are not particularly intellectual. They have, been, they have not been reading so much of Panchadashi or, you know, um, Drigdrishya Vivek or whatever it is, uh, advanced or any other advanced text of Advaita Vedanta, not engaging in uh, intellectual debate. But they have a kind of deep devotion to Sri Ramakrishna. They have worked hard all their life in the ashram, whatever work has been given to them. They have led simple, austere and hard lives. Now, at this time, when, you, when I talk to them about Vedanta, when I say, when I, sometimes the occasion for discussion comes up, they get these Vedantic insights just like that. It's immediately clear to them. And they, their conviction comes also very clearly. Understanding and conviction comes very clearly. In contrast, I have seen professors and scholars, highly trained, who have read much more than me, not convinced, not have, have not understood also. They make mistake after mistake. So why? This is the difference in the purification. Purification of mind. Absorption of Vedanta, the, the insight must flash. It's not enough to read about it. It must become your own truth. Like that person uh, in, uh, who was being uh, counseled by Dr. Albert Ellis and who said, I just now realized all these expectations I had of this drunken person was unrealistic expectations. You could have told him that, him or her. But you have to, that person has to realize for oneself what I thought was most justified is most unjustified. You should not have expected these things. Similarly, this Vedantic insights it must become a living truth. And purification of mind is absolutely necessary for that. Uh, Sri Dhamma says, how does struggle in householder life exactly help us progress in our... This is by purification of mind. But remember, remember, it must be for the purpose of God realization. Somebody um, may say, so Arjuna, if he goes on and fights a battle, he's been fighting battles all along. Isn't that karma yoga? No, it is not. Till this point, he was fighting battles for dharma artha kama. For doing his duty as a kshatriya and for becoming prosperous in the world, for getting a kingdom, whatever, whatever a warrior prince used to do in those days. That was the purpose. The purpose is very important and the attitude is very important. Then only karma becomes karma yoga, otherwise not. I do not want anything from it. I am doing it as a worship of God or I am doing it for the welfare of others. I have no personal gain from it. At least this attitude must be there. All right. I'm not taking the other questions. I'll just read one more verse and stop. Actually, this verse requires some explanation. Let me just read it. Verse number four. So a new, new term is introduced here. Sangya yoga prithag bala Pravadante na pandita ekam apyasthita samyag ubhayor vindate phalam. Sankhya and yoga, uh, it's only the ignorant who say that these are different. Uh, even if you follow one, you will get the result of both. So, what does it mean? What is Sankhya here and what is yoga? Why suddenly is he talking about Sankhya? So, here again, the matter of interpretation comes and I'm following Shankaracharya very strictly. To put it simply, what, what does Shankaracharya make of this verse? He says, Krishna introduces this term Sankhya. What does Sankhya mean here? It means a person who has formally become a monk and following the path of Jnana Yoga. It's following the path of Jnana Yoga. He has formally become a monk, spiritual seeker, and uh, uh, is practicing Vedanta, Shravana, Manana, Nidityasana learning Vedanta, thinking about it, meditating upon it and leading the life of a, genuinely leading the life of a monk. That is what is meant by Sankhya. So here Sankhya does not mean the Sankhya philosophy only. Yoga. What does yoga mean? Yoga here means a grihastha, a householder, who is a spiritual seeker, who is also following um, karma yoga and also in addition to that jnana yoga afterwards. 
in order to get moksha. So being a householder and a spiritual seeker, being a monk and a spiritual seeker are the two paths mentioned here. This is Shankaracharya's and the interpretation of Shankaracharya. And the purpose of both, the goal of both is moksha. If you are a spiritual seeker in any one of these paths, your goal is moksha. So he says, those who think these two are different, they will not lead to the same goal. Bala means children uh, are ignorant people. Ignorant people think these two are different. Being a householder, being a monk are different. Even if you are a spiritual seeker, no. If you are a spiritual seeker, both of them will lead to the same goal. Ekame api asthita samyak. Take up any one. Asthita means practice it, samyak, sincerely. Follow it sincerely, fulfill its conditions. Then, ubhayor vindate phalam. You will get the result of both. Result of both means both lead to the same goal, which is enlightenment and freedom. You will get both. You will get, you will get the result of both, which is freedom or enlightenment. Moksha, Brahma Jnana. Na Pandita, the wise do not see a difference here. So one, after the Brahmacharya studentship, the initial preparatory phase, one can directly become a monk and seek enlightenment. That's fine too. One can be in householder life and seek enlightenment, practice karma yoga and jnana yoga. That's fine too. One can be in householder life and be a spiritual seeker. At, at one point later in life, become a sannyasi. Like in traditional, you know, after Grihastha, then Vanaprastha, then Sannyasa. One can become a monk also. Some people do. That's fine too. All of them will lead to spiritual realization. This is the big point he's making here. And it will run counter to teachings of some of the sects which were prevalent at that time. And some of the early Buddhist sects were very clear. Only if you are a monk, a bhikkhu, or a bhikkhuni, monk or nun, then only you can become uh, enlightened. Um, other sects claim that only if you are a, a monk in a male body, and then only you become enlightened in this life. Otherwise, you can be a pious religious householder and then the, with good karma, next life you'll become a monk and then you become enlightened. But Krishna here is saying that's not the point. It's in this context that this is, seems, seems to be such a uh, unique, very powerful teaching. All right. I think we'll stop here. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu I'll be like that monk with pincers who grabs the money. So <laughs> I give a, one of my regular reminders of um, do keep uh, donating. It's, it's easy if you use the PayPal. If you go to the website and there's a, a button where you can donate whatever you can, what you feel like, that keeps help, helping us in this time of the pandemic. So that's my digital pincer with which I can grab the money. <laughs>